Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the panel. My name is Corey. I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion Los Angeles, and I'm going to be helping to moderate the panel discussion today. So with us right now, we have Abby and Michael from the film, and we're waiting on a few more of our panelists. But I'll just uh, get started by saying, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to drop the questions you have in the chat, and we'll make sure to circle back to that in the Q&A. So uh, I would love to start with asking each of you to sort of introduce yourselves, uh, what groups you're a part of, and what you did in the film. Michael, you want to go? Oh, me? Yeah. Um, OK, I'm Michael. I, um, in the film, I'm uh, turning off a pipeline. I've, uh, I've collaborated with a bunch of groups. Um, I started a kids group called Plant for the Planet. I worked with Al Gore's group on doing slideshows for schools. I, uh, I helped get 350 Seattle going back in the day and uh, a handful of other groups that I've worked with, including Extinction Rebellion, which I'm I'm uh, really, really um, helpful about. Um, I listen to all of Roger Hellum's stuff, and he's one of only two people in the world that I agree with. <laughs> so I'm glad to be part of the Extinction Rebellion panel this evening. I'm actually on the Washington coast. I'm trying to save my battery to take pictures of this uh, hiking group. I'm volunteering um, to co-lead a hike. Uh, out on the Olympic National Park coast uh, for some young men coming of age and, and do a rite of passage journey. And it's great out here, and I can't imagine coming of age in 2021 um, with everything they're facing. Yeah, we started our trip on the first day. The first day it was our record-breaking heat, and uh, it was really awful. Anyway, um, I just want to say I'm going to try to stay on for at least a half hour, maybe a little more, but I got to get back to the group at some point. And um, there was one other thing I want to say. Um, ah, I'm losing it here. Okay, I'll pass it to Abby. Great. Well, thank you for joining for the time you have. We really appreciate you taking the time today. I am Abby Brockway, and I um I'm a member of the Delta Five, which uh, blocked an oil train um, from going to an oil refinery in Anacortes, uh, Washington. And um, we did it so that we could go to trial. And uh, so you'll remember the trial scenes, I'm sure, in the film. Um, let's see. So you met my daughter and husband in the film. Um, I have been, I first kind of got into this movement when I signed the um, Keystone Pipeline Pledge of Resistance and I just casually signed it on the computer and that just changed my life as far as who I've met since then and how I've um, been active and how I've made different choices to try to live a simpler, lower level life, which has been really rewarding and um, yeah. I love the fact that both of you started out with, um, in a very similar way to how I started out with like signing petitions and doing just ordinary lifestyle changes or, or talking to students about climate change and how that turned into, in uh, both of your experiences, going into nonviolent direct action. Um, so that actually brings me back to part of the theme of this panel, which is Nonviolence. So Extinction Rebellion has a message and a strategy of nonviolent direct action. And something I really liked about the film was that it showcased really diverse examples of what nonviolent direct action could look like, as well as uh, the excitement and even the joy that can sometimes be present as part of this nonviolence. So I just wanted to ask both of you, what was your experiences with Nonviolent direct action and, and what it looks like for you. Well, uh, do you want me to go first, Abby? Sure. Uh, you just have to, you don't see the screen, but Bill just showed up in the back of, you can see his rig in the back, and he's uh, just sat down Bill. and joined as well. <laughs> Hi. Great. 
Um, sorry, I, I just asked the question, but I, I would love to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself as well. It's great to have you here today. Me? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Oh, uh, sorry, it's been a little bit of a stressful ride in this old truck to uh, this uh, Shelton. Uh, anyway, we're, we're doing some support for an indigenous uh, uh, salmon summit over the next couple days. And um, we're still driving around this 1995 ox truck that we used to carry uh, kayaks in and puppets and it does everything. But uh, she's a little, little temperamental. And um, my name is Bill Moyer and I run Backbone Campaign with um, my friend Amy Morrison and a lot of a team of other folks. And um, we do artful activism and creative organizing and strategy. and variety of things over the last 18 years. That's awesome. I love the fact that um, all of you seem to be in the middle of a very activist centered day. Um, that's just really amazing to me. And the fact that you made time to be on this panel. So very happy to have all of you here. Um, so I'll kind of circle back to um, the question, which was about nonviolent direct action. So. Um, a lot of you probably know that Extinction Rebellion has a strategy of nonviolent direct action. And I really liked that the film showcased what nonviolence can look like in our communities and in our individual lives. So I kind of wanted to ask, what's your experience with nonviolence? Because there is definitely a difference between nonviolence and not being violent. There's like a very subtle difference. And I kind of wanted to pick your brain on on any experiences that you've had or, or some wisdom that you can share with us. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see then. Um, I think the, the White House shut down uh, in, of the Keystone XL protest with uh, 1,200 people arrested was a pretty great example of nonviolent direct action that was effective back in, was that 2011? And, um, and that kind of put 350 on the map and as a nonviolent direct action group and, and Keystone XL on the map um, as a target. And um, it was effective in raising the awareness nationally so that, you know, whatever, 10 years later, uh, that pipeline could be incompleted. And um, as far as nonviolent direct action inspiration, I, I would just read and reread letter from Birmingham jail and think about it and, and read uh, the book that it can be found in is Why We Can't Wait, uh, which Martin Luther King wrote the following year. Uh, just prior to getting the Civil Rights Act passed. Um, and it, it details some of the Birmingham crusade. That campaign was uh, incredible. And some of the elements were getting, you know, 5,000 young people to flood the jails um, and for days. So um, lots of great stories from that. And uh, well worth finding that and reading it. Um, uh, Bill can talk about high activism. And uh, I think, uh, you know, and then as far as the nonviolent thing, you know, everybody points to Gandhi and King. And, uh, and a lot of people would say that they are our greatest failures because they set these goals to do these impossible things to change the world, change the culture and didn't entirely succeed if you look at what their specific stated goals were uh, in their lifetimes, and yet made it possible for a movement to grow and take root and changes to at least begin. What we're up against is a time test with climate change, and we just need to shut things down at this point. We've got about 1 billion people overrunning the planet, and we've run out of the clock. So... Um, so nonviolence to me is a little different, uh, different, and um, and I actually think of it as a shot across the bow. I think that people who are committing nonviolent civil disobedience are probably the forerunners 
to um, what the the Department of Homeland Security or somebody else would call eco-terrorism. Um, but I think it's going to be just a very basic physical fight for survival against industry. And I think uh, within a few years, it's going to be anything goes, and it's probably going to get very bloody before long. So I like to think that if you can risk getting arrested peacefully, nonviolently now to take the fight, you know, to the oppressors, um, Peacefully, I think that's a pretty amazing, wonderful thing to do. I am still on probation. I served six months inside, and um, and then I've been out for like I'm on. I've got like another half year to go, and um, and I'd say that my time inside was pretty liberating. It was some of the best time of my life. Actually, I was I was focused. I was grounded. I I was reading all day and doing yoga and meditation and. And I felt like I was in the right place at the right time. I was getting letters from people telling me all the things they were doing in their lives. So um, I can't recommend it enough. If you haven't gotten arrested and gone to prison yet, what are you waiting for? <laughs> I love that you you brought um, the civil rights movement into this because um, some of the NBDA trainings that I've personally taken um, we're, we're definitely centered around that and, and uh, kind of looking at history as, as examples. Um, I would love to hear more about kayaktivism, which is something that was quite new to me as a term that I hadn't heard before. So would you like to tell us about that? Because I, I know, like, I want to hear some of the emotions of that day and, and what it was like to have a nonviolent um, direct action that at least from what I was seeing in the film, looked in, in many ways very exciting. Um, would you like to share something about that? Yeah, the film, uh, thank you very much, Corey. So the film captured multiple days and over a, 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 a span of time. Um, I just, I just, my heart is still kind of resonating with, uh, with what Michael said. And I just recently interviewed, um, Diane Wilson of Texas, who's done, I think she said 26 hunger strikes. And, 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 I, and I think that, you know, I just, and also I wanted to get ground in what your original question is, what, you know, the nature of the, that, what is nonviolent direct action. And of course, I'm sure the people who are watching this know about all that, but um, I, for me, it's about the, the sacrifice, the pain, the suffering, the danger, the risk, is all on the person who's doing the action, not people who are the target of the action. And so, uh, so in that has a way, a power about it of, 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 of not instilling fear and reaction in your opponent. And, and, and also more so than in the opponent, I think is in the, the, the society that's watching, uh, that, that they feel that you, you, what they're witnessing are the people who share their values and their aspirations. And that, that is key because it's the tacit participation in the system that keeps us, uh, it keeps it going. And so, um, you know, Michael's advice and uh, Diane Wilson said, everyone should spend two weeks in jail. You should do every, do every, do as you can get there the right way, but uh, you know, uh, it's been two weeks in jail. And, uh, and I, I think that that's inspiring to me at this moment, because I think the urgency that Michael is, is speaking about is, is, is poignant you know, as we see these weather events and such, right? So, um, so the beauty, the th reason I love uh, Kai activism is because uh, the vulnerability of, the, uh, of being on the water, the, um, the act of being on the water with others, the experience of, of the, 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 the depths, the, yes, the vulnerability, but also the beauty, um, the direct connection to what you're protecting or what you, uh, what you love. Uh, I believe that people risk things and take, make sacrifices to protect the things that they love and the people that they love. So uh, connecting to that love in the action, building relationship by 
doing an action that other people say that you're they're on your team. <laughs> they want, and I think that what happened in um, it happens a lot is that uh, like in the kayaktivism, right? We we trained and we trained and we trained to for, for it for the shell no kayaktivism. We trained for a particular thing, and we we wanted to stop this thing from moving up to Alaska, and um, we we but what we needed to get to convince people that they could actually stop it was a picture of them doing it. So we had to do something that was not escalated, that was not risky, that was family friendly first. And that ended up being the picture that honestly was a cause for us to, um, to that was a cause of our, some of our victory. It wasn't actually the, the escalated actions on the water in Portland. Those were also very important though. Um, I would say the, 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 the drilling rig, just so everybody knows, totally got to Alaska, right? And then it was that, uh, the, uh, the, the icebreaker that got a, a gash in it up in um, Dutch Harbor that had to come back to the Pacific Northwest, go to dry dock in Portland. We brought, all, we were all heartbroken uh, kind of, you know, after that thing left because honestly, some of our organizing got undermined by big organizations that were kind of grandstanding and they, they made it impossible for us to actually do the thing we had been preparing for, which is super sad and very disturbing. But then even in Portland where we stopped and, and Greenpeace did an amazing action on the bridge, the kayakers were on the water. There was this nonviolent riot on the water and there were 200 people on the dock chanting, stop that boat, stop that boat. To me, that moment was a victory, but a lot of people who expected us to actually stop the boat was like, oh damn, we lost the boat. Let's chase the boat. That chasing the boat wasn't the freaking problem. That wasn't the goal. The goal is to get move the society, to, to get culture on your side. So that like, um, like Shell said, when they backed out of their Arctic drilling was that um, they said unsatisfactory results from their single well rather than their two wells. And that's a longer story. And, um, and the uh, regulatory uncertainty. And what that is code for is that the political atmosphere for allowing them to do what they wanted to do in the long run and, and commercialize it did not seem to be worth taking the risk. And so that that's how that's how we won that. Check. I really um, one of the things that really resonated with what you said was sort of the theme of love, because um, we have a saying called love and rage. Um, and that's something I, I found really impactful for my own activism, because it's balancing the feelings of anger um, alongside the love. Um, uh, Abby, I'd, I'd love to hear your input as well on nonviolent direct action, because what you did, I found very inspiring and very creative as well. Um, I would love to hear about your experiences as well. Sure. First of all, I just to respond to what um, Bill was talking about, the other thing that, I mean, the vulnerability was there, but what made the visual was the size and scale. And um, you know, mosquito fleet, but really those small, those uh, people that felt so small, but together so powerful, um, also were trying to delay the boat. I don't all, I don't think they all believed that they were doing the strategical part, but they, we did feel like we won because we were just trying to delay since the time of drilling was so short and that was what happened. So we won, we did have a winnable short-term goal um, and we did experience so much um, connection of groups that normally don't get together, uh, get along with each other. It was the most difficult and most um, beneficial exercise that we had to do in that many of us um, had to just have these group agreements to say, look, we don't all have the same tactics or vision or belief system of how to do this. Some didn't want to be peaceful, others did. So we did have to have group agreements to say, this has to be peaceful. This has to have that peace. And so um, some of the fringe groups um, could only participate if they, part if they were willing to you know, be in the group agreement. So it was really good to work together on with one, one goal and be able to, um, to move forward. I, I would also just say like, 
there was a whole parallel land action and that was like the opposite and of the beautiful action on the water and the nourishing it was under a bridge it was dry and dirty and people were hot and angry and just it was it was really and resentful some of them were resentful they couldn't be on the water just because they had shorter jobs where they had to come and go more often and they couldn't just go on the water for an hour or two so there was a lot of other stuff that came to the surface that was helpful to actually be seen and and um a lot of us privileged activists got to see oh yeah there's a bigger thing that's happening here and so learning to to really kind of just get deeper into the weeds of what this is like like to be in a movement um and think you're you know everything's going so great so it that was good i just want to also mention one other thing uh, michael talked about hunger strike or a uh, build it both of them maybe um there was one action that we were i think all involved in too that was we went to the capitol um in olympia of washington and um Department of Ecology was having a hearing and we just wanted them to use best science. And um, we didn't have a hunger strike, but we fasted for three days together. Some of us had to do it remotely because we were working, but uh, the rest of the folks stayed in Olympia and fasted. And I've got to say that the public comment time when we were all about gonna break our fast after the comment time was one of the most sacred hearings that I've ever been to like it transformed the space um the people that we I mean we know a lot of the people that uh that um from ecology and and the people that do the hearings they run the hearings and um and the commissioners and everybody that listens to us so we knew each other in a relationship but they saw us differently and and we saw them differently it's un i can't explain quite what it was but it was very powerful and it's one of those surprising surprising when you can bring the sacred and you can actually feel it which bill organized like he has a backbone has a um, action camp or had an action camp where every summer we would um, get together and plan an action together. And then at the end of the week, we would actually do the action. And um, so we had some um, local and native uh, people um, teach us um, their culture and how they um, approach things differently in their activism. And they, um, they just taught us, they just, gave us so much wisdom. And when we did our action, we did it in the spirit of how um, they would do it. And it was just reframing. And it was just such a gift to be like looking through a different cultural lens. And um, we prepared gifts for the elders and we went there and we had made t-shirts for them. And one of the things that they told us was, take only what you need. You know, this is like a larger thing. We've heard this um, from several books we've read. And like when you're harvesting in the forest, you only take what you need because you're stealing from your grandchildren if you don't. But it's interesting how we were offering these t-shirts and um, they would say, you know, we'd say, do you want another one? And they'd say, oh, no, I just want to take what I need. And so like, it's so universal that they were also sharing it back to us again and reinforcing this. So there, it's just like, going on this journey, there's there's other acts of civil disobedience, which is really just being dis disobedient from our the way our culture is just speeding up in one direction. So like counterculture, I feel like is also that. That's a beautiful note on system change because um, yeah, one, one thing in the, the youth climate movement I've really realized is how can you change the system if you don't have system change within your own community? So that was a beautiful note. Um, one thing I'd love to touch on is art and activism because I, I know Bill with your experiences and Aji, if he's able to join as well, um, uh, Extinction Rebellion um, uses art a lot, like street theater and street art and Red Rebels and everything um, to kind of change society's uh, perspective on the crisis. So um, what are what are your uh, experiences with art in the movement and how it can really change, um, like a, a put a spotlight on these social issues? Okay. I don't know if the wind where I am is a problem for the microphone or not, but let me know if it is. Um, so. Uh, 
Okay, so yeah, it's, Extinction Rebellion has been super creative and, uh, and really beautiful. And not just in this country, but also like in the UK, we got to see some really amazing work that they're doing. And it's truly, uh, it's, uh, it's urgent and it's joyful uh, a lot of times. So um, uh, fundamentally, we're trying to talk about uh, values. And, and fundamentally, I think this is about, uh, about cis when we talk about system change, we're talking about a paradigm battle. Um, did I cut out or are we good? No, you're good. Okay, so uh, we're talking about a paradigm battle. Well, what the heck is that paradigm? You know, what's the, what's the, which, how do we contrast those? And, and I feel like that's where we see indigenous leadership being super important for uh, not just, uh, yes, it's super important to uh, ground ourselves in a sense of, uh, of prayer, but why, you know? It's because of this, you know, there's the sacredness of, of the journey the, the, and the difference between um, a, a paradigm where everything's for sale and expendable and has a price versus one that anything that's actually important does, is totally not for sale. So, uh, so I think the defining and grounding in the sacred is really an important part. And I think that that's why we see such important leadership uh, coming from indigenous movements around the world. In the Pacific Northwest, it's just just obvious. Like here we are, we're in an event. Uh, the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians are helping, you know, like pass a resolution about taking down some dams so that to restore salmon. Um, then the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, echoed that resolution a couple weeks later and now here we are in a summit where um they have like shifted the political calculus they've shifted what um what's acceptable and what's expected of these so-called leaders so um so there's that and art has to deal i think art is best when it um when it, it identifies those things i think artists are expert at communication and try and and trying to communicate not to the head, but to the heart and the gut, and um, and the, and so, uh, okay. And then one last differentiation I'll make for uh, the kinds of tactics that we use as artful activists, and that is, there is there are very strategic aims uh, when we're doing action. One is like to grow the cohesion of the group, to have a lot of fun, to make people want to come back and do more of this, to like decolonize our lives from all that other distraction, to delve into what's really important. So, um, so there's things like narrative, like street theater, like stuff that, that you can't really just take a picture of it and get the message. That's really inwardly focused. So I think it's good to be to know that when you do it and when you're thinking, oh, we're going to go do some street theater. Don't think that that's necessarily what's going to get on the news. Right. So so then the I think then you exercise the other aspect of your communication skills and you hone things down to what ex you imagine what you want on the top of the fold on the front page of the paper. And, and, and you want to have that, what is going to be the most compelling, moving thing? And you make that the one choice that the press has to take. And you keep coming back to that. You just force that, that image, that value, that vision into the, uh, into the mainstream. And that's, I, I think that's, uh, that's where I'm, I have a particular interest in that because I, I want to leverage our, our time that way. I, I like it all, but. I just think that it's good to know the difference of the, the kinds of things that we do. Check. I loved that. Um, yeah, that way of phrasing it. And um, there's so many different types of art in the movement. I would also add that um, art and also humor is such a good entry point for disarming people that might be negative to do something. So like the absurd um, is good. And um, when my first act in, camp at Backbone, uh, they, uh, Bill showed this video of this, um, uh, this, they did, they went into a, I don't know, was it a target or target? Yeah. into in this target and, uh, just completely overtook the store and was able to like surprise everyone with a message and then, and left. And I mean, Bill, you should talk more about that, but it's, it's, it really just kind of makes you Think. I mean, these flash mobs have happened before. It's not like that's not happened, but um, like in this 
work that we do, like those are the fun things. I mean, one time we stormed a um, TD water house and we blew up a pipeline. And so it like, it just inflated and it went, we had, it went all the way to the back offices and curled around and we read a letter. And I don't even think the people that work there realized that TD was funding, Waterhouse was funding horrible things. And they were good. They did not know what to do. And they ended up shutting for the day because they were just so flummoxed by what happened. So I, I think a lot of these things just like bursts of surprise. I mean, I know y'all are doing stuff like that. It's just that I've experienced so much joy. Like, like Bill was saying, it's got to be fun. It's got to be visually interesting. We took the same pipeline when Obama was for the Keystone Pipeline. He was going to a dinner for a fundraiser and we inflated at the Secret Service, like had to pat it down to see if there was anything in it. And it was just inflatable. And they're like, okay, I guess we can let him hang out on the street and blow it up and sing songs while he came through. So you I don't keep know. saying blow it up. Blow I can't it up. handle that. We, we, we forbid that word. We say you inflate things. <laughs> You know, it's just like, what if they just edit your thing and you talk about blowing shit up all the time? Oh, yeah, I, that's true. Yeah, that's right, right? So, no, I, so I really appreciate here, that actually, because I am, I am still on probation, so I really appreciate you watching the language. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Anything for you, baby? Thank so, you, Abby. Yeah, to clarify, we are talking about uh, inflating a... Um, I'm assuming like plastic um, pipeline, so completely yeah. peaceful. No one got harmed. No one was intended to be harmed. Exactly. This is very Thank important. You. So, like, I'm in the back of the Backbone Campaign's action truck, and um, and so we have like a 14 foot salmon, and it fits in a suitcase, and it fits in a suitcase because you use a fan to inflate it. We have a 11 foot diameter globe in a suitcase. We have a 24 foot um orca in a bag here we have uh another seven foot orca calf so yeah they all get inflated not yes inflated inflated um so i just wanted to but touch on one thing that the humor and, and is super important obviously and the use of satire um and and humor is sort of a spiritual thing right at, at some, a certain level and then but there's and there's also I'll tell you the the activist who made the biggest difference for salmon and orc salmon and orca was a an orca mother uh, Telequa who who whose calf had died yet right after childbirth and she pushed that calf and everybody knows this story right because she would did that she pushed it over a thousand miles for 17 days. So there's something also poignant about that, the pathos, right? Is that how you say that word? I always want to say pathos, pathos. Anyway, um, but uh, anyway, so the, the, one or the other, you know, but, but something that comes from the heart. And uh, yeah. I love that. It, it very much resonates um, love and rage to me, totally. I, I keep hearing that again and again with the joy, the laughter, um, using humor and everything. Um, one thing I'll, I'll ask, um, each of you, um, I know, uh, in the Extinction Rebellion podcast, this was a question that was kind of asked as well, but how have your communities and family members come to terms with the sacrifices that you've made in your activism, including civil disobedience and, and breaking the law? Um, if you don't feel comfortable answering this question, that's totally good. I just wanted to see, like, if, if when you did these things, if your community's view has has changed at all, um, and if you see sort of the um, target audience as being the sort of system we're fighting against, or if it's more that you want your community to listen for individuals to listen, and sort of your your target audience with that, Michael. Okay. Um... I think my family would have to speak for themselves about um, their sacrifice, their their uh, relationship to what I did. Um, and it would be wrong of me to put words in their mouth. Um, I also uh, saw, um, yeah, the activist community is, 
also one of my targets. Um, I'm incredibly disappointed with the green industrial complex because they are selling our last few days, months, years to do anything at all to prevent the extinction of life as we know it. 95% of endemic species on the planet, plants and animals, now face extinction this century. Um, if you want to get worked up, listen to any of Roger Hallam's videos all the way through, um, any of his recent ones, and you'll, you'll understand what we're up against and what you need to do immediately. Uh, they're in L.A. I think, um, yeah, uh, we actually have to stop things. We actually have to stop things. Um, shutting down London was a really bad PR move. Nobody likes gridlock. Um, who was the target? Who was the, you know, who was the audience for that? And yet most people, because they did control the narrative, most people sided with XR England in that shutdown for 10 days. And, um, and that's unheard of. We're always in our groups, always talking about how we can't piss anybody off. We can't, uh, you know, upset anybody. We want to look good in the paper. And yet, uh, if we can find a way to control that story, control that narrative and say, this is an emergency, this is life and death, um, then a lot of people are going to say, yeah, well, okay. So, you know, some rich people didn't get to work or whatever. Um, I always imagine like in LA, the greatest, the greatest protest would be something about preventing uh, rich and famous people from getting their, ostentatious cars into the movie studio lots. I don't know why, but I just have this image of like the security gate and the person there and, you know, people outside just blockading the studios. I don't know. Anyway, you can, you can have that idea for free. Um, I've, I've gone a little round the bend here. I want to say one more thing um, about audiences. Um, our audience is changing. Um, within the last few years, public opinion polls have shifted greatly. We just completed a project here in Washington called Washington Climate Assembly. Your third demand in Extinction Rebellion is a citizen's assembly. Well, I went on a hunger strike and we did one. And it's complete. And 90 to 95 percent of people in the state of Washington want 140 plus things done on climate now. Unfortunately, nobody heard about it. So um, what with COVID and what, I don't know. So this, um, the Citizens Assembly is a replicable thing for California, for LA, and a really worthwhile thing to do, especially if you have a good PR person. And, um, and the other thing I'll say about audiences changing is um, that the, the land, the land, is changing. The landscape is not the same. Um, the crises are going to be greater each month. And uh, what was it? The U.S. Army College put out a report on climate change, and they said that the U.S. Department of Defense faces mission failure within 20 years because they won't be able to fight battles and wars in the changed landscape. Um, so non-governable societies, uh, even by military rule, are going to become the norm in most places of the world pretty soon. This is, this is a real battle. And as much as it's a symbolic battle and a battle for hearts and minds and a battle for culture and identity and values, we are the oppressors. We are the wealthy people consuming the fuels. So we are trying to stop ourselves from being ourselves. And we've got to do it immediately. And, and I'll end by just referencing Greta. If you haven't read the science, you do not understand that. You do not understand the time frame for climate recovery, the, the, the end of 
the possibility of climate recovery, which is where we're at right now. So um, we can't betray our young people. We cannot accept a Green New Deal. We cannot accept a jobs and infrastructure plan. And we cannot accept the, the whatever solar panels and stuff and say that's enough. We have to ban, we have to outlaw, we have to shut down entire industries. So pick your targets well, think, dream big, and uh, good luck. I'm going to sign out. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your insight. It was great as a surprise to have you here today, and especially when you're in the middle of a busy day of, of doing things for the planet and for people in it. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good to bye hear you, Michael. Abby. And Bill. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so I guess uh, since Michael left, I'll finish up with um, a question that's hopefully uplifting for people in the audience, because the film left me with a reinvigorated feeling of just feeling like the crisis is huge, but there are people, ordinary people um, like us at Extinction Rebellion and other groups who are just doing our part and, and fighting against system, uh, fighting for system change. So I guess my last question is, we're fighting against a broken system that's killing people on the planet. Um, but sometimes we don't talk about the future we're fighting for. And so I kind of wanted to hear, um, it's, it's maybe a difficult question to answer, but your idea of the future you're fighting for, whether that's for future generations or for now, for a specific place in the world. Um, yeah, what's, what's the future that you're fighting for? Hmm. The, the, these questions are really complex because I think you have to hold it all. Um, and just to acknowledge what Michael said, like all of that is true, except for just just in in seeing politically how divided we are now, like I don't know how we how do we not we can't just keep going to our far sides and expect that everyone's going to come over to your side. So like for me, the struggle, and I've talked to Michael a lot about this is like, what is the best strategy? And to realize that we're so far apart and some people are so having their heels in the ground that um, I'm not sure that people would, you know, sometimes you repel when it's so dark that you won't, you don't want to do anything. So this film is very uplifting. And um, when Bill talked about the calf, the mother and the calf, like that was so, um, it just spoke to your soul so deeply. And um, we have um, a leader in our area, um, Paul Chiokden Wagner, and he is uh, uh, from the Samish uh, tribe. He said that the orcas will save you know, Puget Sound. And it's, and he said this before all of this happened, but like, um, it's the hummingbird shut down the, you know, the, or delayed the Trans Mountain Pipeline or, you know, the spotted owl saved the Pacific North. Like all of these things are small creatures that, that make a huge difference. And like getting in, 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 uh, in line with, with the world and um, trying to really have a pulse on what is possible. Like, I do believe that something will break through and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what it is, but I feel like there's more of a spirit that I'm looking for now. Um, and so I think looking to the future, like for us, I think saving salmon is what we're like focused on right now is real it is it's so interconnected to so many different things that are in our eco structure structure right here um and so when i see a wave you have to ride it when it feels like it's it's when it's resonating like in a larger you have to just have be awake pay attention see where that energy is and um and surf it like right now that is what the future is for us right now like to look too far to the future it's like um just to wrap to wrap up with the um martin luther or yeah martin luther king's 
speeches are on my podcast. So when I do shuffle, I hear him, um, some of his, uh, he, when he preaches and speaks. And just today I heard one and it's like, oh my God, he could be talking for right now. So he was so visionary that it's like a lot of this stuff is reawakening and coming to pass and so relevant right now. And um, so, you know, we know, we know it, we just have to like, it, when it awakens, we have to be show up and be present. And I just want to thank Joe for making this film because it is true that um, there's a lot of documentaries that, that just shut you down. You're so paralyzed and it's just the powerful people. These, you know, it's not, it's not these heroes that are highlighted in the story. It's like, it's just ordinary people that are, are doing stuff and it's their communities like there's so many people behind the people that they showed in this film and it could have easily been in in LA and XR like it could have been anywhere but like just the the and the music and the everything about that film like that is a, a guy that does this kind of work and that is what his art form is. And that's how he speaks to the people and awakens the souls and gets us connected. I'm, and so I just feel like each of us has something like that. Um, and so we have each other. I just, the one other thing I wanna say is the reaction to people in my activists. I actually lost a lot of communities, but I gained a lot of communities. And that's where now I'm trying to find out how, why does it scare the people that I hung out with? Why does it scare them that I'm doing this work? And like, how can I then now have conversations, meet them where they are, share this and bring them along? I mean, like we all have circles and we have some that are in it and some that are not. My whole family was thinking I was crazy. And then after the film, I mean, after the trial, we had a family meeting and they got on board. And my dad is like, he's he just eats breathes and sleeps this but when I told him what I, my plan was he was a, a trial attorney and he said that this was no place to take this is into a courtroom and at the very end um, my attorney said to my dad well you'll just have to um, to break the law so that you can have your own trial and so like he was so involved in it and stuff so you know, and then my dad had told me, I wish I, I wish you would have committed a felony so that we would have, you know, in the appeals process, it would have been a smoother transition. So the whole, it just all came full circle. And um, yeah, so I, I kind of touched on several of the questions, but check. Yeah, I love the wave metaphor and surfing. Considering we're talking to people in LA, of course, who the frick surfs in the Pacific Northwest unless you got a freaking wet so suit? I mean, it's so cold up here. Nobody surfs, but we get it. We get it. You know, thank you, Abby. Uh, so, it, it's, and I think the salmon is a wave because the salmon are sacred and the salmon are, yes, part of our identity. And they're a sign of abundance of nature. They're a sign that, that when humans get out of the way, nature can provide. And they're, uh, they're a symbol of a different paradigm. And I keep back, coming back to the paradigm battle because it's all, to me, it's all connected, whether it's universal health care or housing co-ops or, or, um, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, um, I, I don't want to forget to mention a couple of things. One, you all in LA uh, area, you have some really great great organizations in your area you know doing great work and um i'm i'm friends with a bunch of folks down at east yard communities for environmental justice and um and they're they're an amazing group of people and i just want to do a shout out because i think that activists are there's lots of ways to be an agent of change and if we try to make it this narrow we're going to be this big a movement okay but when we understand that Joe Gantz is a change agent. He's a storyteller. He's reflecting these stories out to the world and to back to us to build that consciousness. Um, there are culture workers. There's, I'm here, there's going to be a, uh, a, um, a totem pole that's traveling across the country and it's going to stop here tomorrow. And it's uh, that's cultural work. And that's part of change making. It's, they're not getting arrested. They're going across the country with a totem pole. 
Um, there's uh, there's the East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice, which is community-based organizing. And one of the things that I take from learn a lesson from um, hanging out with community organizers around the country is, and I am a very lucky guy. So like, I, this is my job, right? And and it's a weird job that I, you know, it's awesome. So, but it's completely, it's a little bit of a like, whoa. Um, but, uh, but I do get to meet a lot of people. And so I feel like I have a, a responsibility to share th th those lessons from that. But anyway, um, so this, we build, an organizer told me, we build from the power we have to the power we need. If you think that you're going to write a, 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 um, a script for a box office, you know, blah, 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 hit, and you haven't made a YouTube video, you're in la la land. So, um, so you know, you have, we have to, we, the reason we need to be connecting to all of these sectors of agency, all of these ways of making change, the solutionaries, the people who are growing food, the people, the people at the Long Beach Time Exchange, the Time Bank system, you know, um, those are some other great people in your area. Um, and we need to, we need to extra, we need to decolonize at every level of our lives out and I'm talking about decolonizing our freaking time so that our and our community and our what we engage in remember when the labor movement was strong they had freaking bands they had band contests they had choirs they people didn't have time to go and not that Netflix existed but that was not a choice right they got people's in, lot, people engaged in the lives that's why I think the church-based movements are so powerful because they come out of a sense of deeply grounded and account the community that's accountable to its, each other. I think that like these uh, sort of unaccountable, I think activism can be kind of unaccountable. And, 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 and that makes us very vulnerable because you can bet your ass that our opponents want to divide us and conquer us, right? So you got to be, you, you got to, there's a lot where you're very vulnerable when you're not grounded in community. And so I think the, I, that the idea, yes, of course we wanna bring our community along, but we wanna do that because we wanna not forget we have, time, have to spend time in our community and we have to invest in that time. So like, and so that brings me to the last thing of like COVID. Don't squander this thing that has cost so many lives and so much pain. Don't squander the good lessons from it. I can't imagine that there's anybody listening to this that doesn't have something that they're bringing, that they want to hold on to, some threat that they know is precarious because it'd be easy to forget. But at some point, at some level, we all learn something really deep. I think one of the things we learn is that the, the status quo is by no means inevitable. It's propped up like, and it's a house of cards. So, um, so it's, you know, thinking outside the box is not a problem when the walls of the box had disappeared. Okay. So, so we can reinvent that. And we want to hold, I think holding on to connection to the, the loved ones, to place, to slow the fuck down. <sighs> Remember to grow a potato, you know, whatever it takes. That I think we need to be multifaceted in our work, and I think we'll be healthier and a more sustained in the long journey of this work, even in the urgency. Because I don't think we can miss I, some. Uh, there's this uh, Zen koan thing, story about the Zen masters. The um, the uh, he's he comes to the people. He says. The enemies are at the gate. A disaster is upon us. We must act slowly. You know, it's the opposite, right? We're so freaking reactivist all the time. We must, you know, that's why I love like following the lead of indigenous uh, I work and 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 trying to just show up and, and learn from that. Okay, I'm going to shut up. That was an important message of decolonizing our minds, decolonizing our communities and growing potatoes and regenerative culture. That was that was a great last, <laughs> last sentence. So um, before everyone leaves, I would uh, love to welcome you all to post any 
links to your organizations in the chat or um, uh, anything like that so that people, people can learn more about what you're doing, uh, maybe current campaigns you're part of, maybe something about the salmon um, <laughs> and, and pipelines and all of this important work that's being done. I just wanted to say one more thing is uh, one of the questions was what um, do we think or what is our view on who the target is? Yeah, and I, I just um, in tying to what Bill just said, I I really feel like insurance companies and financial institutions um, are something that's resonating with me recent and um, right now, and I, I think that community banks investing in your own communities and that's something doable for anybody that doesn't really understand but like can learn about how when you move your money to a credit union or a community bank you're investing in your community and you are not um with an institution that is financing these destructive product projects so they don't have to know if they don't have to be overwhelmed by that but it's like a good way to like feel like you're doing something and like get people to to move in and i feel like money talks i mean that's the um one of the websites is the Mazama uh, talks. Um, so I do think that um, for me, that seems like the financial one and then just our local Puget Sound Energy. So um, I think it's, it's the financial and insurance institutions for me. That's an awesome answer. I would be really negligent if I did it mention Solutionary Rail. It's something that's totally obsessed me for the last eight years. And um, I, globalization has totally failed and has left so many people behind. And that's had such a negative impact that regenerative agriculture, re resilient communities need resilient infrastructure. And to me, there's something really powerful about uh, the um, the uh, efficiencies and, uh, and the idea of of creating uh, an elect a decarbonized, efficient rail uh, system that's electrified uh, that is um, uh, that is and it's not just about passengers, but it's also about freight and serves every community. And if you and very few of us know anything about, I knew nothing about uh, freight rail, but if folks are interested in that, um, they can learn some of the stuff that we're learning by following solutionaryrail.org. Um, I will try to add the, uh, there's a great petition to support Umatilla uh, youth around the salmon and the urgency around uh, taking down some dams. Um, and I'll try to find that and get it in the chat. Um, uh, yeah. So solutionary rail is my is a thing and the salmon is a thing and yeah. And then if people like creative activism, if people want to like do like portable light panels that, that like LED things and and inflatables and giant banners over, you know. Or you know shine lights on stuff giant spotlights on things there are people in la who have all these tools that we work with and you can yeah, let us go and, uh, like and uh we can connect you with them or uh, yeah so anyway i'm not going to do a show and tell all right but that's that's it but it is a good resource because like when uh the rail the President of BNSF came to stay. Um, you know, you can project stuff and to embarrass him in front of this hotel wall, or they did it at the um, dam, the river dam, and there's projecting light projective messages, you know, on all sorts of things. So it's like a fun, it's like a fun thing to do. Oh, here he goes. I'm okay, I couldn't help myself. Show and tell. So you know, you know, if you've ever made a banner and spent all night trying to make square letters and then painted it and then outlined it and then you realize oh shit next week we have to have a different message and by the way how big can you hold how big a sheet can you hold over an overpass with the wind blowing not a very big sheet so, but if you put it on deer fencing with removable and reusable letters and get yourself a whole alphabet going you can change up your banner so you can get a banner toolkit at salute at backbonecampaign.org forward slash banners and uh, yeah you should definitely check out backbone campaign 
we've been doing this stuff for like 18 years and we've uh, tried to make things really accessible and uh, and replicable and okay art of war stuff very important i'm going to put uh that for nonviolent uh direct action um and um and social movement um, i'm going to put a, a page in here about that but um the one of the some of the principles are variety rapidity um uh, uh harmony so rapid you got to be able to respond quickly when they see that wave uh, variety. You have to have a variety of tactics. Otherwise, your opponents start to understand what to expect and they know how to react. Um, um, you have to harmonize. It has to be grounded in a strategic and vision and values so that lots of autonomous actions be, can be happening with, with serve, moving the same purpose. And as Napoleon said, except for I'm going to say it in English, audacity, 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 always audacity. So they never expect the thing that is so audacious, so like, who would have thunk of that? You know, um, and, and you just do it. You walk in like nobody would have imagined it and you get away with it. Abby Hoffman, uh, the secret to being a successful uh, revolutionary is getting away with it. And um, Saul Linsky, uh, the, a good tactic is one your people enjoy. Thank you for all of this information. I'm sure that everyone in the audience is going to go home with some great ideas. <laughs> um, we have made sure to post um, some of those links in the chat, as well as um, those that were said. Thank you so much, Abby and Bill, for joining us. It was awesome speaking to you and meeting you for the first time. And thank you for taking the time today to, um, yeah, to join us, to share your opinions and your advice and show and tell and everything. <laughs> it was awesome. All right, cool. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here as one of the organizers. If you guys like the stuff Bill was talking about, 17th of July, we've got an art build in Grand Park. Uh, check it out. We'll be and we'll be doing some of the stuff that Bill was mentioning in LA. Uh, follow XRLA on Twitter and, and you'll hear about it. And then obviously uh, follow Bill and Abby. And I will duck out again. Thank you guys so much for everything. Thank oh, and share the film. If you like the film, share it with your friends. Um, Joe is really working hard and Karine is re really working hard to get this film out and doing everything to get people to see it. And so if you like it, um, invite people to the website to um, get a ticket. Awesome. We'll make sure to post that link in the chat. Thank you again, both of you and everyone who came in the audience today. Thank you for supporting this awesome cause. Bye. Thank you.